So the other day on stream, something very interesting happened. Basically, somebody asked me a simple question that has been on my mind ever since. They asked me very directly, Luke, do you think there are any games out there that people hate on just because they like hating on it? And it got me thinking, are there any games that just don't get a fair shot simply because they're from a developer people don't like or because there's some scandal going on next to them or because of the graphics or some story element? And all of that is obviously true for some games. We could point to The Last of Us Part 2 as an example of a game that gets a ton of hate for story leaks that didn't end up being completely true or a game like Watch Dogs, which got a ton of hate because it had massive graphical downgrades, even though it was still a pretty good game. Or even a mobile game like Diablo Immortal, which is an impressive game by itself, but is so overridden with microtransactions that few people will end up giving the game itself a fair shake just because management was so greedy. But time and time again, there's one common thread with many of these examples of games that don't get a fair shot, and that is the publisher and developer. And unfortunately, a lot of them are made by Ubisoft. Don't get me wrong, Ubisoft has done their fair share of crap. They certainly deserve a lot of the hate that they receive, at least in my opinion. Everything from management to the pricing structures to the crazy microtransactions and cosmetic crap and the, the way that they just like put out bloated piles of garbage and then hope something sticks. I, I get it. I'm no like Ubisoft sycophant. I mean, I made a dedicated three hour critique on Assassin's Creed Valhalla where I called the game an actual travesty. So for anybody who thinks I'm just like fanboying over here, just understand, I dish it out as well as I take it. But that brings me to the central point of this video. I'm getting distracted, I'm sorry. And that is a game that I think has not gotten a fair shake that many people hate on even though they haven't played it just because they heard some YouTubers ranting and raving against it. And it's a game I really think you should give a shot if you haven't already because I find many parts of it downright phenomenal. And of course, I'm talking about Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Now, one of the more interesting things about Assassin's Creed Odyssey is that Ubisoft for years has been accused of not wanting to give Assassin's Creed as a franchise the chance to be helmed by a woman. They just haven't wanted to do it. Long story short, we found out there were some very sexist people in upper management over at Ubisoft. It makes a lot of sense now. Basically, they didn't think a woman could do that and then still sell copies of games, which is really rich. So interestingly enough, their choice was to, instead of just making a female protagonist, they decided to do both. So you can choose between Cassandra and Alexios. They are fully voiced. You can go through the entire game as either. I've played the game through with each one of these. In my humble opinion, I think Cassandra is just better. It's just a better performance. Alexio sounds like he's gargling marbles most of the time, and Cassandra has been acknowledged as the canon or canonical choice. So as far as the lore is concerned, Cassandra is the actual protagonist. So might as well just play with her. That's at least my opinion. And boom, just like that, we are in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Kefalonia Island, 431 BC. From the outset, first impressions, the game is freaking gorgeous. Even now, what, like three, four years after its launch, it's impressively beautiful. It is expansive and it has one of the most bafflingly large maps of any game in recent memory. It really is remarkable. Uh, they fly through here, show you some landscapes. Oh, he caught a fish. Beautiful. Oh, and he drops it. Oops. Oof. Old ruins, which is crazy, like 431 BC or whatever year I said. Like, that's ancient to us. But two people in Greece, in ancient Greece, there were things that were still ancient to them. And in some cases, even more ancient to them than they are to us, which is just baffling it makes you appreciate humans just in general and then we come up on cassandra and this is where we meet our leading lady she's so great she's so great like i'm just saying choosing cassandra for your run of the game is is the best way to go hey, for sure <laughs> what a way to start hey shit face get down here uh, they get introduced I gotta say, this is one of the more impressive openings to the game. 
that uh, that I think Assassin's Creed has had in a while. Even like Assassin's Creed Origins started kind of clunkily. This game just gets right to it, and it works really, really well. I, I actually really like this intro. Then we do some parry. We slash, slash, slash. The combat system also doesn't get enough love. Like, this thing is actually fairly robust. It's pretty zippy. There's a lot of fluidity, but in general, I think it works really, really well. It's responsive. There are tons of different weapon types that you can choose from and also countless abilities that you can unlock and discover as you play through the game, which makes it so everybody's version of Cassandra will feel relatively different. It's a far cry from Assassin's Creed of old, for sure. It's much more Witcher 3-like than any of those other games, but it still works really, really well. And I think this is an important thing to note as well about Assassin's Creed Odyssey that's, that's just important for us to discuss while this little bit plays. So Assassin's Creed had an identity crisis around 2014 2015 basically right around the time assassin's creed unity came out and had all sorts of problems makes sense because that game was a bit of a train wreck but still as a result in 2015 when the witcher 3 came out ubisoft saw that and was like hey everybody loves the witcher 3 we should do that why don't we just do that so they decided to start work on the next huge installment of assassin's creed where they would try to learn from the witcher 3 and they actually did a half decent job of it. In Assassin's Creed Odyssey, we have dialogue choices where you can choose, of course, generalized dialogue uh, options, which allow for branching possibilities. There are more branching possibilities for the narrative in Assassin's Creed Odyssey than there are in The Witcher 3 which for some people doesn't matter because The Witcher 3 is much more linear. It's more of a narrative experience that's finely crafted. It's not about the branching choices, but there are countless things that you can do in Assassin's Creed Odyssey that are very, very impressive. You do one thing over here and it has ripple effects hours down the line. I'll show you one of them in just a minute that I talk about all the time on this channel because I think it's very important to note. Now we have access to the open world. And one of the first things I want you to notice is the task that's been given to us. So you see in the top left, so it begins, find and talk to Marcos. Marcos bought a new vineyard in Kefalonia, and he is in the southern part of Mount Ainos. One of the things they did in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which I find freakishly impressive and very compelling, is that they took away the standard Ubisoft guided markers that just hold your hand all the way across the place. Instead, they tell you a generalized area of where you need to go, just like it would be communicated in dialogue. And in many cases, that's how you find out where these places are. Hey, he lives on this island and he's over here on the south side of the mountain. Go find him. He's over there. You'll, you'll, you'll find him. And so that's the information you're given. It doesn't magically tell you exactly where to go. It gives you the generalized area. And then you look, oh, Mount Ainos. He's in the southern part of Mount Ainos, as we see there. So we'll head over here. I still think that Ubisoft could get rid of these um, markers just like this. You can hide them. And I think that that works way, way better. Because let's be real. If we're looking at this map and then we say, okay, South Mount Ainos. We see an undiscovered location there. We know that that's where he's going to be. So it's not as hidden as it might initially sound like. So if you just hid these and then you explored, it would be much more interesting because you would go and you'd explore the whole south side of the mountain and you would end up in the right place, but it wouldn't feel as though you were having your hand held that little bit extra. So if I were you, I would just turn off that particular notifier or only turn on the uh, historical points of interest and let those be marked but here i mean you can see this map it's just ridiculously large it's unreal how big this game is now i want to make my way over to that big statue climb it and show you just how expansive this is but one of the things you'll notice is that the game is much more open than even assassin's creed origins was which came directly before this game and it's, it's wildly impressive because it feels as though Assassin's Creed Origins was the proof of concept for this game, which is saying something because I think that Assassin's Creed Origins was really good by itself. It, it didn't come off as a, a proof of concept at the time, but compared to this, it feels like it was a demo. I mean, it, it's really impressive how they took all of those knobs and just cranked them up. Now, while we're on our way up the mountain, I feel like I should explain 
a little bit of what I mean by this game doesn't get a fair shot. And what I mean is specifically among the generalized gaming community, it's easy to hate on Ubisoft. As I said before, they deserve a lot of it. But Assassin's Creed Odyssey is one particular example, which for haters of Ubisoft is just a really bad one to pick because it is vast. It has unbelievable amounts of content that's varied and unique. Every side quest has overarching consequences that ripple through the rest of the world and the rest of the game's main story as well. And Bucks, almost every single stereotype that Ubisoft has fallen victim to in the last 10, 15 years. This game is one we should all hold up as an example of good Ubisoft. All of these other ones like Valhalla, bad Ubisoft. And it's really frustrating because this game feels like they got everything working, they figured it out, and then Valhalla came out and they just went back to their old ways and just forgot about this free exploration based uh, gameplay and allowing the player to choose where they wanted to go, what they wanted to do, to have stories backing every single little thing, to not just focus on broad quantity over quality. It's it's just so much better across the board. Uh, pardon here, I'll move my, my camera over the... The, the genitals there we go see youtube i'm advertiser friendly <laughs> dude for real i would love to get that like flag from youtube and they're like hey there were uh there was some stone genitalia in your video on odyssey and then i could be like no -uh, i covered it with my face <laughs> i would just i would just love to file that manual review no my face covered the genitals you don't know what you're talking about for real but here we are at the top of the statue. And this is one island. This island's pretty big, but it's the starter island that serves as the tutorial for the game. And it alone is, is impressive and beautiful in its own right. But everything you see in the distance, you can visit. You gain access to a massive ship that you can take on in ship fights. There's so much here, it's hard to even begin explaining because we right now are on this little island, Kefalonia. We're looking this way. We can't even see the total distance over here. And past that, there's an entire ocean filled with places to go. Literally everything you see on screen right now, you can visit and explore. And then there's more behind it that you can't even see. It's unbelievable. This is an entire world for you to explore. But you know what? We need to actually go, not just explore this little island, we need to see what the game has to offer later on. So let's jump ahead to a later save file. Okay, so this right here is a save file much later in the game. Oh my God, no! <laughs> Oops, my horse is dead. Oh well, what a way to start this portion of the video. Oopsie. Anyway, everything's great. Here we are at a later save file with Alexios. Uh, as you can see, I did play through the whole game with both. Um, including Alexios. He actually was my first choice. He's the one that I played with initially, and I greatly regretted it after just a few hours. But here we are, we have Alexios, we're gonna deal with it. We are much later in the game, and as you can see, there's tons of points of interest, tons of islands and different things to see, explore, and be had. So as you can see, in some of the later game areas, we have access to huge cities that are very expansive. We, of course, still have access to our birdie friend that we initially got introduced to in Assassin's Creed Origins. And we can fly this thing all the way across the map if we want to. They don't prevent you from doing that. If you just want to fly with the bird, the eagle, the hawk, whatever it is. Uh, I think it's a hawk. Yeah, it's a hawk. If you just want to fly with a hawk, that's totally cool. You can do that all the way across the map. And then when you're done, you just pop back out and the camera whips back to Alexios right back where you are. It's it's pretty impressive that it can just fluidly do that, but anyway. You also notice the little guy with the red helmet down there? That is actually a uh, mercenary bounty hunter. There's a system in this game that's centered around these mercenaries that are actively hired to try and kill you. It's almost like Shadow of Mordor and Shadow of War with the Nemesis system, but in this case, there are a bunch of these mercenaries where all they do is chase you down and try to kill you. 
And they all have different abilities. They have different power levels, different weapon types, different things that they do to try to get access to you and take you down. And if you happen to defeat them, you get all sorts of bonuses, perks, and things like that. It's it's really cool and bizarrely something that Ubisoft seems to have just given up on for the franchise, even though I thought it was relatively compelling. You also notice I can apply poison and fire damage to my weapons. This is one of the things that's kind of bugged me uh, with Odyssey is that they just gave up trying to be realistic at all and just decided they were going to do whatever they wanted to. <laughs> so they're like fire effects on your weapons. Sure. Magical abilities to apply like poison. Whatever. Super slow-mo abilities. Eh, fine. That sounds fun. They, they just stopped pretending as though they were trying to be grounded. And I can respect it because you know what? This is a video game. It doesn't need to be super serious all the time. But it's also a, a confirmation of the total departure from realism or anything grounded um, that we all were kind of worried was happening. Uh, whack, 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 whack. Boom. I love, I love that combo. It's just nasty. Oh, goodness. But these, I mean, these little fights, these, these guys, man, they put up a fight. It's not easy. And these things just happen all around the map, no matter where you are. See, we just defeated the mercenary. And then we pull up the menu. You can see him. He turns away in shame. And uh, you can see they have different abilities, just like in Shadow of Mordor, Shadow of War. Shell skin takes less damage from ranged attacks. Didn't really help him. And Fang Stewart travels the world with a Link's companion, which initially made the fight complicated, but whatever. Um, and these fights go from relatively easy to extremely difficult. You see, we loot them. We get mercenary boots, a ton of items, and it's it's great. It's good fun. Keeps things interesting. You can also see on the map, we have this bounty system. We can pay all bounties if we want to. That affects how many of these mercenaries chase you down in a given region. So if you just don't want to deal with it anymore and there's just too many people chasing you no matter where you are you can just pay all those bounties it'll get rid of them and then you're good you also notice i can jump from like stupid high heights and not take any fall damage you probably noticed that earlier with the horse uh that's because randomly at level 25 you just stop taking fall damage it's never communicated to the player why there's no like answer see whoop you just do a flip and then you're fine it just comes out of nowhere. Like one day you'll just be playing and you'll reach level 25, not think anything of it. And then you'll take a massive fall and you're ready to quick reload and just deal with the, the fall damage. But then he just rolls and he's totally fine. It, it's really weird. I still remember the first time I leapt from a ledge when I reached level 25 and didn't take fall damage. And I was genuinely really confused. I thought I found like a glitch and then I looked it up and it's just, nope. Level 25, they just take away fall damage. They figure you dealt with it enough. So it's just, it's gone after that. And now here we are in our ship, which is a, a beauty to behold. I'll tell you what. It was one of the most baffling things about Valhalla, I think, which is that there just weren't like any ship sequences at all. It's like you had the little Viking ships and that was it. It was all river based and it, it just seemed like such a missed opportunity because they developed all of it in this game and then just didn't use it come to find out it looks like the reason valhalla didn't have ship sequences or anything like this where you could travel between islands and raid and do stuff like that off the coast in england isn't because it was like a narrative choice it's actually because they were developing skull and bones which was supposed to be their standalone pirate game it was supposed to release around six months to a year after valhalla so they didn't want to shove out Valhalla, which had all of the same systems that Skull and Bones was going to have. So instead they cut it out of uh, Valhalla and left it for Skull and Bones, which is funny because we're just now getting that game and it kind of looks terrible. We'll talk about it, that in another video though, so I won't burden you with it here. But the point is, it's funny that they stripped this stuff that you're seeing on screen right now out of Valhalla to put it in Skull and Bones. And it seems like that was a total blunder because Skull and Bones is probably going to flop. I'm willing to be surprised, though. Like, if they really blow me away and it ends up being really, really good, I'll, I'm more than happy to be surprised and change my mind. It's just right now, it doesn't look that good. I'm just being honest. Do you want me to lie to you? No, I'm just saying. So what is this game trying to be? 
it really is not trying to be Assassin's Creed. That's clear to see. This is very, very different. The clearest way I can explain it, though, is that it is trying to be The Witcher 3 set in ancient Greece with an Assassin's Creed coat of paint. And if that sounds awesome, yeah, it's because it is. But here's the thing. I think so many people played Odyssey expecting just like Assassin's Creed Syndicate in Greece. And th if that doesn't make sense, you're not alone. I just don't think it would work. The only way this game works is in its current form. And it actually works very, very well. But a lot of the people that rant and rave against Odyssey and say, oh, no, the game's terrible. The game's terrible, dude. They haven't played it. They don't know what they're talking about. And if anything, they probably, if they even touched it, played it for a couple of hours, realized it wasn't old school Assassin's Creed, and then dismissed it, which is a total blunder. Because if you do that, you're missing out on one of the best and most technologically, graphically, and narratively impressive RPGs, adventure RPGs specifically, of the last five years. And I really mean that. This, like, there's a reason this game was nominated for Game of the Year. People forget, but this game was put into the same category as Red Dead Redemption 2 and God of War 2018. That's how good critics who tried to keep a level head thought this game was. It was in the same category as those games, and obviously it didn't beat them. Um, they won some Game of the Year awards from some publications, but still, that's very, very impressive. A Ubisoft game nominated for Game of the Year? When else has that happened? Like, ever. The unfortunate reality, though... Oh, look at that. The whale's right there. I love it. The unfortunate reality is that I think this game sold very well. Uh, it, it did very well, but Ubisoft seems incapable of grasping why one game is successful and others are not successful. So Unity had problems, most of them technological related to management, right? That's par for the course. Origins was pretty well received after Syndicate came out. It was a reinvention. It, it did pretty well by all accounts. Then Odyssey comes out. It's really well received, sells very well, is very popular. People love it even if it's not like standard Assassin's Creed. Then we get Valhalla, which is just an unfocused mess where they looked at Odyssey and said people liked Odyssey. Odyssey was big. Therefore, let's just make everything bigger. And that was the whole design philosophy. Just go more, more, more. We'll have the game be 115 hours. It'll take like a month and a half for anybody to finish playing it five hours a day. Let's just do that. And they just totally missed the point of what made Odyssey special, which is that this game has narratives tied to every single side quest. Some of the side quests in here are so memorable. I made dedicated videos on them that have done millions of views. If you've been following this channel for any length of time, you probably know what I'm talking about, which is the something incredible video that I did on Assassin's Creed Odyssey back in the day. It was also very successful because it was fresh and new and introduced different ideas. It was a setting that was well thought out and justified and the systems that are at play here are all pretty well thought out and work well together. Not only are there naval systems and combat systems and dialogue systems and branching narratives and decision trees and all that, but there's also political and faction systems where you can take, as you see on the right side, certain areas and align them to different political groups, such as the Spartan leadership or the Athenian leadership. Based on who you side with, these different regions can have little skirmishes and fights based on the outlines you see on screen, and that can lead to different side quests being available, all sorts of things. It's amazing. It's also one of those things that I'm baffled they stripped out of Valhalla because Valhalla, I've, I've said it in the critique, you could have in Valhalla given us the map of England and had Viking skirmishes between different Viking tribes, which they kind of hinted at narratively, though we never really get to experience it other than like very narrow uh, chunks of like si certain main story quests that are over as quickly as they begin. But you could have had regions on the map just like this, but in England where certain areas are controlled by different groups of Vikings. And then you fight it out between your clan and others 
and then see who can take over England. And maybe every once in a while there's uprisings and then you got to go stamp them down. It's such an obvious system to include in Valhalla, but they just stripped it out for no reason. Like this was a good addition. This was really cool. Oh, it's weakened. Oh, it's fortified there. So I've got to go target leadership in that area if I want to take them on. Okay, I got to go do these quests kill the captain in the leadership house and then i gotta go over here and perform an assassination and i gotta do these these things to weaken the political standing of the people at that location it's a cool system and they just totally stripped it out of the series it's so bizarre but it's not the only time they've done this they stripped out the parkour system of course and the free running from unity to syndicate to origins to odyssey where now in odyssey the free running is basically run at wall climb up wall or jump off wall like that's it there's no depth there's no finesse anymore i mean once again to reiterate it just goes to show assassin's creed is not assassin's creed anymore these games are open world adventure action rpgs that's what they are so uh, as much of a fan as I was of Assassin's Creed 2 II and 3 and the original like Etsy tr Ezio trilogy in general across the board, those games just don't fly nowadays. They just wouldn't sell well. They wouldn't be received very well. These are the games people want and these are the games people buy. So Ubisoft tried to do it with Odyssey and honestly, they did a damn good job and they deserve credit for it because what they have here is really impressive. Now, I mentioned earlier that there's some things that Odyssey does which are just bafflingly impressive to me that I think really deserve a lot of credit that not many people talk about when they refer to Odyssey because they usually just point at the easy things of Ubisoft game, paid cosmetics, big game, much content, not good, and it's almost unintelligible at all, but I do want to call out something I really do think is impressive and if you think it's not impressive, let me know in the comments. I'll reevaluate if I feel like you're making a good point, but I, I really think that this deserves some praise. Now for this, I'm actually gonna use a YouTube clip just because this particular quest line is like five to six hours into the game. And I just honestly don't think I need to go through six hours of the game just to show you this cutscene that I can show you with the video. So today we're gonna use the help of Chang Plays um which is a youtuber he did a really good job uh, compiling this i'm assuming it's a, a he i'm sorry i assumed maybe you're not a he i don't i don't know anyway chang did a great job of compiling this footage and i want to show you this so this is a quest line called the blood fever early on in the game uh specifically on kefalonia and basically what happens is there's a plague going through this small little village and as you can see, they've got a family with children tied up and they're saying that there's a sickness present. Basically what's going on is there's a plague going through the village. They've had to execute pretty much everybody. This family are some of the last people standing. And the only way that they can eliminate the plague confidently is by also executing this family, burning the bodies and just playing it safe. They're, they're sick. They got to, yeah, the sick must join the dead if they are to save the living. He's right. Here you're given the choice. You can choose to step in and kill the guys that want to kill the family and let the family go free. Your little sister's like character, Phoebe, she's super appreciative of this and you get some brownie points with her. Or you can let them execute the family, go about your day and just tell Phoebe, eh, life's tough sometimes. They were sick and it was a tough thing, but it had to be done. What happens later is as you are sailing, well, let me see if he's got footage of it. Okay, this is from another YouTuber uh, named Jason's Video Game Source. And he goes back to Kefalonia after making that choice to let the family live and to kill the guys that were going to kill the family. And what you discover when you return is that the whole place, the entire island is covered in these piles of bodies burning bodies the color has changed it's dark and it's bland everybody's sick and hacking effectively you choosing to let that family live allowed the plague to spread to the rest of the island and now everybody on the island is dying your previously colorful vibrant island home is now overridden with the plague and is downright disgusting and, and horrible 
And it's all because of that one choice you made in that small quest. And it's not even something you would notice if you didn't return to the island later. But because you do return to the island, you see this consequence of your actions. And that's impressive. Not many RPGs have conclusive consequence for your actions in side quests full stop, much less consequences for actions in side quests that you don't even necessarily have to see. They are only present if you go looking and seeking that validation to see what actually happened after that choice was made. In this case, we didn't have to return to this area and see what happened, but we did and now we see it. And it's made all the more impressive when you look at the game's map. Because again, Kefalonia is over here. The island falls apart if you let that family live, but you've moved on to all of this. Started exploring all these other islands. It's very likely a lot of players won't ever return to Kefalonia once they leave it because there's so much other content out there. So I would bet you there's a lot of players who made that choice to allow the family to live that never found out or realized that that caused the entire island to become overridden with the plague. That's impressive. And that shows a confidence in Ubisoft's design philosophy that we just don't really see. My biggest critique of Ubisoft across the board in their game design philosophy is that they hold the player's hand way too much. They don't trust the player to figure things out on their own. And so instead they go and they actively hold their hand with everything that they do. Tons of mini markers, tons of things uh, on the heads up display to tell you where to go and what to do next. Tons of little dialogue trees telling you how to solve pu puzzles as you're in the puzzle itself. Things like that. They just don't trust the player enough. But for something like this, there's a, a conclusive quantifiable consequence to your actions. And you don't even have to see it. Because they're confident if you go seeking that answer out, you will find it. And when you find it, of your own accord, it will be far more impactful and impressive. And it's something I wish they would return to. And I hope in the next Assassin's Creed game, we see them do more of this. Because this is what separates amazing open world and RPG design from mediocre open world RPG design. It's that confidence to let the player discover things for themselves and trusting that they will do it and that they will be thankful that you gave them the freedom to do it in their own way. It's what separates Rockstar and Red Dead Redemption 2 from every other AA and AAA attempt at an open world game. It's impressive and it deserves credit. So if it's not clear enough, I really like Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I think this game doesn't get enough love. I think it is a triumph in a lot of ways. And I think you should play it. Not to mention on console, it recently got a 60 FPS patch on Xbox and I believe PS5 as well. So go try it at 60 FPS if you haven't. It's remarkable. It really is. I would say the DLC is a lot less impressive, especially the Atlantis bit I thought was just boring as hell. But the core game is freakishly impressive and you can play it and it will be some of the leanest, most impressive 80 hours of Ubisoft gameplay you've probably ever enjoyed. It's really remarkable. But I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for watching. If you want to see more videos like this made on the channel, make sure to hit the like button so I know that you enjoy them. And leave a comment with a suggestion of what game I should tackle next. I'm always open to suggestions. Also, as I said earlier, I stream over on Twitch. So make sure to check out the link tree in the description box below the like button so you can jump over there and say hi. I stream a lot now. I was able to recently, thanks to you guys' support, help my wife leave her job so that she can stay at home with baby and pursue her passions elsewhere, not in a trampoline park where she was managing. So thank you all for supporting me enough so that she could do that and get out of a job she really just did not like. And now that means that I can stream a lot more and that's what we're doing. So pop over on Twitch. I try to stream every time we put a video up live. So if you're watching this right around the time it's published, uh, come by, say hi. I'd love to see you. But with that, I'm going to leave it there. I love you all. I'll see you in the next one. Hugs and kisses. Bye-bye.